Joining me now is Basil Smichael, Jr., MSNBC political analyst, professor of practice, School of Professional Studies at Columbia University, and a Democratic strategist, and former Congressman David Jolly. He's also an MSNBC political analyst. So, Basil, MSNBC reported that in addition to Harris preparing for policy responses, she's re preparing for Donald Trump to say derogatory things about her. How do you think she should respond if the debate becomes volatile in that way? Punch back. You don't have to do the same ad hominem attacks that Donald Trump is 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 living on her. You know, you don't have to make it personal, but you have to treat the bully as, as the bully that he is. If you remember in 2016, when he was debating Hillary Clinton, he would follow her around the debate stage, sort of looming over her. I doubt that that's going to happen now. But she has said earlier in, in, this, um, in this month and change where she be he's become the nominee, that she knew the type. And if she's going to prosecute the case against Donald Trump, um, then she should also treat him like the criminal that he is, you know, the 34 felony counts uh, that he's received. Treat him as that person. Don't back down. Be, be strong. But also always pivot back to these are our values. We're not moving backwards. We're going forward. So always pivot back to that. Make sure that she reminds the American people that this is an inclusive campaign when he's always focused on a more exclusive campaign. But what is the, the style of that punchback? Is it sticking with the joy? Is it making yeah. fun of him? Is it, does she it's, become more serious with the punchback? You know, it's interesting because I don't think, uh, I don't think you need to elevate him. And, you know, there's this point where uh, folks had said, maybe we don't talk about him as a threat to democracy. You minimize him. Don't elevate him. Make him seem small. Make him seem petty. That's a rhetorical flourish that I think she can handle. You don't need Obama-level rhetoric here, Michelle or Barack. You just need to be able to turn back and say, you know, that's, that's small-minded. That's immature. That's the bully. Don't, uh, don't elevate him. Don't make him seem bigger than he really is. Make him seem pity. And you know what? That gets under his skin. When you kind of ignore him and you kind of push him to the side and make him feel irrelevant, he's going to push back in a way that will make him seem more unhinged, <laughs> if that's even possible, than he already is. David, the Harris campaign has agreed to allow muted mics when the candidate is not speaking after sure. originally <clears throat> wanting them unmuted the whole time. Is this a setback for the Harris campaign, or do you think it even matters yeah. at this point? I, I don't think it matters at all. And I love these pre-debate uh, days because we all have theories and ideas of what she should do. And then it, it turns out to be something totally different, surprises us, and, and she's going to wow the country at the debate. But I, I largely agree with Basil, but take a slightly different approach to it, which is I, I wouldn't have said punch back, but I, I take Basil's point. I think you punch back by being dismissive, by belittling mm -hmm. Donald Trump right. and, and not directly engaging him, almost dismissing him as the old, incoherent, rambling, insulting, xenophobic racist that he is. I know that's hard to do with just a, a wink and a nod, but do it, because I do think there's one question of how to deal with Trump. There's another question of what's the greatest opportunity on the debate stage for the vice president. And I think the greatest opportunity has nothing to do with Donald Trump. I think it's how she engages and exchanges with the moderators on policies and her vision for the country. And frankly, how she defends her and President Biden's record, because she will be pushed on that, just as hopefully Donald Trump will be pushed on his. But the opportunity to command the stage, I think, is in one dismissing Donald Trump for the incoherent uh, aging ex-president president that he is, but secondly, to demonstrate command of policy and most importantly, vision when, he, when she has exchanges with the moderators. Let the American people believe in you on the debate stage. And if she does that, which she's given us every indication she's certainly capable of doing, watch out. It should be a good night for her. So, Basil, Hillary Clinton seems to, appear to agree with both you <laughs> and with David, but she goes a step further. She said in an interview with the New York Times that she shouldn't just punch back. She should bait him mm. uh, that he can be rattled, she says. He doesn't know how to respond to substantive direct attacks. No, that's absolutely right. And if you 
really look back on the ways that he's attacked her. He's I said I had hominem attacks, but he's attacked her intelligence. He he's even attack, attacking her preparation. It's like that's what leaders do. They actually prepare for stuff. And shout out to Karen Dunn. It was a great article in the New York Times spotlighting uh, Karen Dunn, who's been a coach for Democratic presidents and vice presidents in 2008. I used to work with Karen. She's brilliant, and she knows how to do this. She, as the article says, offers these candidates tough love. Said no, you. This is how you go back. You've got to X this and go this way. So I do think that the strategy, and I love uh, uh, David's word, thank you for putting words, uh, the word on the table, dismissive. Being dismissive of Donald Trump is really, really important. It gets under his skin. It gets him rattled. The last thing he wants is to be irrelevant. If you make him irrelevant, then I think you'll really see that split screen of her being this prepared, thoughtful, smart candidate versus someone who you, you would end up saying, I don't want this person leading the country. So, Bezo, I, I want to play a, a Harris campaign ad. Let's speak on you know, policy now. Yeah. Uh, I want you to take a listen to this new campaign ad on abortion that she yeah. has. He told us who he was. Should abortion be punished? There has to be some form of punishment. Then he showed us. For 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. Now Donald Trump wants to go further with plans to restrict birth control, ban abortion nationwide, even monitor women's pregnancies. We know who Donald Trump is. He'll take control. We'll pay the price. So how do you think abortion is going to factor into both the debate, but also ultimately into how people vote in November? Well, just, just I'll start on the voting. There's uh, in, in deep blue New York, uh, Prop 1 will be on the ballot and has language about in, uh, codifying uh, reproductive rights. Uh, and so really important that even in blue states, even if we know potentially the outcome of the presidential, it's going to help down ballot races. So that's critical. But in the debate, and I think for the rest of the campaign cycle, what you do is you, you focus on the fact that Donald Trump wanted this outcome. And you take every draconian measure in all of the states that, we, that you've had these measures, like Louisiana, you amplify that and say, guess what? That is not going to be confined to one state. It is going to be 50 states if Donald Trump becomes president of the United States. David, the last presidential debate resulted in a seismic shift on both campaigns. What do you think the impact of Tuesday's debate is going to be? I, I think all eyes are on Vice President Harris because the American people have an opportunity to take the measure of her in a way they haven't, right? The DNC was a remarkable week for her, a remarkable speech, but obviously scripted and there weren't moderators. This will be a different environment in a live mm -hmm. setting where the American people can see. I think if any dynamic shifts, and I'm waiting for this to really kind of become a theme of the last 60 days, I think Donald Trump has become increasingly irrelevant to the 2024 narrative. And I know that sounds wild. He's the Republican nominee, a former president, getting 45 or 46 percent. But he's stuck at 45 or 46. He's got no new tricks. He's got no new message. He's got no ability to move voters towards him. And I bet between the three of us, we could predict exactly how he will perform on Tuesday night. We know it. Every American knows it. He has one of the most cemented brands in the entire world right now. Nothing he can do will change that. So I don't see Donald Trump being relevant to this race whatsoever, other than how his campaign and their allies spend money on vile, vicious attacks on Vice President Harris. If he is able to move anybody, it will be because he lands something that sticks on Vice President Harris in a really vicious way, not because of any reason that Donald Trump suggests he's qualified to be president again. Mm -hmm.